Hey, welcome for joining us for church this morning. Uh, I'm Jules, I'm the lead pastor here at TFH Oakland. If this is your first time, we just wanna say thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you find this service encouraging and that it impacts your life. We want you to find community. So feel free to get connected, subscribe, all of those good things. Follow us on Instagram, TFH underscore Oak. And we would love to get connected. In just a few moments, we're gonna jump into worship. We're gonna sing a couple of songs and we're gonna jump into God's word and ask God to speak to us and believe in for lives to be changed this morning. Thank you for joining us and let's get ready to worship.
Yo. Oh. 
Man, we love worship here at TFH Oakland, and it's so amazing. We've been getting great reports of people that have found community and finding connection in the middle of our worship. And we're so glad that hopefully you call this place home. Uh, as many as started to gather at the Scottish Rite Center, we've seen many people come to know Jesus and get saved. And actually, right after Easter, we were able to baptize someone. So right before the word, we're actually going to hear their story. But before we do, if this is your home church, we just want to thank you so much for your generosity. It helps us to not only do the things that God's called us to do, but to expand. And we're super excited that all God's doing because God is so faithful. I want to challenge you. Maybe you've never given before, but we believe in the time. And we believe when you put God first, God takes care of the rest. And I want to thank you so much for those that have made TFH Oakland your home church and decided to give. Your generosity goes a long way. And we just say, if you would like to give for the first time, feel free to use the TFH Oakland app. You can go to the website or you can come in person and hang out with us and uh, you can make your gifts there. But we just want to say thank you so much. In the next few weeks, we're going to be doing Discover. So make sure you sign up for that. Go to the website. If you're online, we do a thing called Fast Track for Discover, so make sure you stay connected that way. If you come in person, you can hang out with us. We'll feed you, take care of your kids, which is happening this Sunday, right now, right after service. So if you're watching this at 9.30, uh, you still can make it. You can come to Discover, and that'll be for the next two Sundays in the month of April. We love you guys so much, but let's check out this story before we jump into the Word. Hey, what's up, Father's House? It is Easter Sunday, and we have something very special. Today, we said if anyone wants to get baptized, we're going to dunk. And today, Melissa has decided to go public with her faith, which we're really excited about that. Let's celebrate with Melissa. So today, we're going to hear Melissa's story as she gets dunked in the water of baptism. Go ahead, Melissa. Hi, my name's Melissa. Um, I decided to get baptized today because after, you know, struggling, going through life, through strong and and weak moments I just kind of realized in my weak moments that I wasn't relying on God and I just wanted to um, go through with this baptized today to show him that you know I want to be strong in my faith with him because like you know like without without him I can't do anything like he's the one who gives me strength to do anything so that's why I want to go through this today amen well let's baptize you you go ahead and want to grab your nose let's get ready get you all situated in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we baptize you. <laughs> All right. Woo! You good? Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, TFH Oakland. Thank you for joining us and rocking with us on this great Sunday morning, or whenever you decide to watch this and jump into TFH Oakland. Today, we are starting a new series that I'm really excited about, about called Fruit. Yeah, that's it. It's called Fruit. And the reason why is because I believe that fruit is the evidence of our faith being applied in our lives. I think so many times people spend time and energy producing fruit or evidence of what they believe their life is to look like. And sometimes that leads to nothing. You know, when it comes to fruit, I'm not a big fruit person. Actually, on the contrary, I, I don't really like a whole lot of fruit. And I think there are a lot of weird people out in the world that love fruit desserts. To me, that's an oxymoron. It just does not make sense to have fruit and dessert put together. Why would you take artificial and take the natural and try to mix it? And so I literally do not like hot fruit desserts. I think the, probably the only thing that I can get down with concerning fruit is a popsicle. With that being said, I, I've had some challenges. People have tried to change my, my philosophy according to fruit. And uh, I can say that for the most part, I live with this disdain bias towards fruit desserts. My thing is, is this, if you're gonna have a dessert, give me a cookie, give me a brownie. Come on, somebody, give me some coffee cake. Give me something that I'm not supposed to have. Don't give me no fruit. Don't give me no parfait. I want something chocolatey and delicious. But recently, my opinion about fruit desserts were swayed uh, because we had a friend who was doing keto. I won't name any names, but Melina. They decided to uh, help our family out a little bit on this Easter holiday, and they dropped off a peach cobbler. Now, again, I'm not a fruit dessert connoisseur, so I, I was a little bit hesitant. But my wife went on and on and on about this peach cobbler. And she said, you got to try a piece of it. And I tried a piece of that beautiful, latiste, 
That means lattice. That lattice top with some cinnamon and sugar that was just caramelized and the goo. I mean, when you if you get a fruit dessert, it's really not about the fruit, it's about the goo. You gotta have the goo. And I remember biting into that peach cobbler and man, my, my world was rocked. I know and somebody's thinking right now, well, you know, baby, I got the best peach cobbler. You ain't never had my peach. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't care about your peach cobbler. This this was the this was it right here, okay? The peacob was was on hit. All right? Can I call it peacob? But as I began to eat slices, not too many, because you know, brother trying to slim down, man, I realized that there was something special about this peach cobbler. And I, every bite, I'm trying to reverse engineer, why is this peach cobbler so magnificent? And I come to this one conclusion that the reason why this peacob was better than all the other peacobs I have had, it wasn't just the love, but I believe it was the quality of the fruit in which was used. This was not store-bought. This was not imperfect food, fruits. This was fruit that was harvested from the shire of Bilbo Baggins. Like, this was some... some upper echelon of fruit, okay? I don't know what they did to these peaches, but it was amazing. And it began to challenge my whole philosophy. But as I reverse engineer and come into the conclusion, I've made some understanding concerning fruit, that not all fruit is created equal. That there are some fruits that are produced that may require the same amount of energy and water and sunlight and chlorophyll and all of the other components that causes vegetation to grow and produce. Still, there are some fruits that just aren't produced, are grown with the same kind of quality and care. And I believe that much of our lives, if we were honest, there are things that we are watering, that we are nurturing, that we are adding to that is producing bad fruit in our lives. It's required the same kind of attention. It's requiring the same kind of effort and if not even more energy, but for some reason we're watering the wrong field. There are areas of our life that have been consumed and have created and produced nothing but toxicity that created damage, that created resentment and bitterness and, and, and gossip and hatred and animosity, our, our sexual perversion, where our identity has been twisted and manipulated because of the fruit. And I think if we were honest, it's, it's not just the fruit that's being produced in our life. If we were to able to hone in on some of the problematic, toxic areas of our life, we would realize that it's actually the root system that is contaminated. And when Jesus came to this earth, he talked much about fruit. Actually, in the beginning, the inception of the Christian faith starts in the book of Genesis, where because of Adam and Eve had taken of one fruit, which represented the desire and the temptation of sin that we all fall into, it produced shame and resentment in their lives. And today, as we open up this, this chapter, this series, I really want you to open your heart to God. Open your heart to the Holy Spirit and ask God, God, are there areas in my life that aren't producing, that actually are creating a negative environment around me? Because God, I want to produce fruit and fruit that is good, that is of the best quality. Fruit that, that is evidence of my devotion, of, of my following, of my love for you, God. When people look at my life, I want them to see evidence that I belong to Jesus, that I'm following Jesus. When I look at my spouse, I want them to reflect and embody the fruits and the characteristics of that which belong to those that follow after Christ. You see, I want your life to be more than just about peach cobbler. I want your life to mimic and be modeled after the greatest love that has ever been displayed is God's son, Jesus, who modeled for us what it is to live an authentic, healed and free life. We're going to look at a couple of, of, of scriptures in the book of Galatians, but I want you to understand that in the book of Galatians has actually become a, a pretty phenomenal book to me because it's a book all about freedom. It's a book that is trying to contrast what it is to walk in legalism and what it is to walk in freedom with God. And the book of Galatia is not actually directed to a, a church or a particular group, it's actually directed to a whole region. Uh, there was a group of, of Celtics that had moved into Asia Minor, um, and before it was 
overtaken by Rome and its empire, these people lived there and they began to find Christ. And, and before they found Christ, the Roman empire came in and managed it and all of this. And so some people have this ideology of faith and some didn't, some were new to this whole concept of following Jesus. But many of them became radically saved and began to follow Christ. They heard the teachings about Jesus, the miracles and the signs and wonders about Jesus, and they began to live for him. And much like us today, that even though it was a region, these people become slippery. They started to drift. They started to be misled by the things that were causing chaos in their lives. And in this portion of scripture, Paul begins to address of what it is to live a free life. He starts off Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, which is one of my favorite verses of Scripture. He says this, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm and not be burdened by the yoke of your oppressors. He says the intention, the desire, the design, the reason why Jesus came was to bring you freedom. Not bondage, not legalism, not rules, but to create freedom. A life where you can live this exuberant, passionate life free, this, this life where you're not restricted, you're not bound, you're not living out of avoidance, you're not living out of hypocrisy. It's a life of freedom. And therefore, it, it could create joy. And I've realized that in my 17 years of pastoring people, I really just want to see one thing happen for people. I want people to be happy. And I believe sin, I believe arrogance, I believe pride, I believe all the things that we're going to talk about today is actually hindering you from being happy in this vertical relationship and you from being happy in this horizontal relationship. And we're going to talk about some things that may be challenging you, some things that the Bible is very blatant, very explicit about, that we have to say, God, I want to produce fruit and I want my life to look like yours. Galatians chapter 5, it says this in verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you, not, you are not under the law. Verse 19, it says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery. I like that word, debauchery. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Paul is holding nothing back. He says this, I warned you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul is being very open and frank with these people. He's saying, hey, if, these, if, if this is a lifestyle that you are living, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. He goes on and he says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such thing, there is no law. He's saying there is no restriction. There is no opposition against the things that he has just mentioned. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep and step with the Spirit let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. You see, the thing about this book is that God's heart and design for this book is to create an appropriate understanding of the freedom that we have in God through Jesus. You see, we don't have to be legalistic. We don't have to be negligent or avoidance of sin. We don't have to bend the rules to feel good about ourselves. We don't have to live in shame. It was and it is for freedom. And what Paul begins to address in verse, in verse 16 is this internal fight that we have as believers. Hey, if you're new to the team and you're walking with God and you're starting to realize what it means to love Jesus and to follow him and you're trying to live right and you're trying to do the things that you believe are honoring and there are some things that you're gonna encounter that really creates a struggle because you're like, man, I really wanna do those things. I may not be sure of how hazard it is, and maybe these are things that I've done for my whole life, and now you're telling me these things are contrary to what God wants me to do? That's tough. Or maybe you're a believer, and you've been walking with Jesus for some time, and you still are battling those same areas of temptation. One, I don't want you to create a, soft, a, a false sense of God's grace or understanding of that, 
But how do you deal with those areas of temptation so that you're able to produce and have bear fruit the characteristics that look like God? And what Paul begins to address, and he says this in chapter 5, verse 16, that there is a battle and is a war that is going on inside of us. And if we are going to fight the battles that rage outside of our bodies, outside of our, our scope and outside of our sphere, we must rectify, we must deal with the battle that is raging on in our own desires. And the first thing that we have to understand is this, is that you may, for this time, maybe you're fighting all wrong. You know, in recent events, I try to teach my daughters that they could be whatever they want to be. They could, they could be a doctor, they could be a lawyer, they could be a police officer, loves Utopia, all of that. So, you know, I'm really about empowering my young ladies. And one of the things, I, you know, I want my girls to be strong. I want them to be, you know, so all of that. But I remember trying to teach my daughters, it's kind of the basics of martial arts. And I remember teaching my daughters how to put up their fists. And every time they would go into their fighting stands, you know, you want to have your, your right hand here to defend your face against attackers. You want to have your jab quick and handy, move it sharp and fast. But my daughters would come into their fighting stands like this. I'm like, babe, you're not going to do anything. You're fighting all wrong. And what Paul is trying to address us is this. He's trying to teach the church how to fight accurately because many times we are trying to fight what's going on inside with external tools and weaponry. And maybe you're trying to deal with some of the craziness, the chaos, or maybe some of those areas of your life that have become so consistently problematic, but maybe you're fighting all wrong. He says this, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You see, the Christians of Galatia, these were believers that were taught the truth about Jesus, but they started to falter. They started to forget what it meant, and they began to add to Jesus. You see, when you begin to add or subtract from the pure truth and relationship of who Jesus is and what God's word says to our lives, you begin to live in error. And that error is going to create a level of toxicity in areas of your life. That is called sin. And see, what Paul is addressing is this, is that the flesh is not just a body, but it is actually a carnal, an unregenerated aspect of the human nature that because of sin, we are all fallen. And what we want, we want to do the things that directly disobey God, but make us feel better is that the flesh, it's a mentality, it's a perspective. And when we see through the flesh, we only see the world through, through its natural spectrum, through the natural focus. And we begin to gravitate to the desires that gratify that nature. And what Paul is saying is this, there is a war with your flesh. Even though you may be saved and you love Jesus, when you wake up in the morning, there is a battle that is going on in your body and that, or in your, in your person, your identity. And that battle is to dedicate itself to the old man, the old mentality, the old way of thinking, or to accept the new creation, the new life that is in Christ Jesus. And what was going on in the, in the Galatian region when it comes to this church is that these people started adding religious ceremonies to their faith and walk with God. To where Paul is like, wait a minute, are you guys bewitched? Is like WandaVision going on? Is this some kind of false reality that you're creating? Did we not discuss the principal truths that to follow Jesus is about grace? Paul, who was the apostle of grace, who said grace about a hundred times just in his writings, he begins to talk about the undeserved, unmerited favor of God. And he says, this is about grace. It is not about law or legalism or avoidance of sin. This is about walking in the spirit and allowing God's new nature to work on the broken areas of your life. And there is a fight, but you have to fight correctly. What was going on in the book of Galatia, they would say, hey, if you really want to love God, you have to be circumcised. Could you imagine coming to church? Maybe you're new to the team and you're falling in love with Jesus and you're 30 something years old and you're just trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus and live a holy life. And we're like, man, come to the Discover class. You go to the Discover class, man, I love this church. This church is great, man. The people are cool. They, they're welcoming there. I can find family and community here. And you start serving. And before you start serving, you're like, man, maybe I should get baptized. And you get baptized. 
And you get out of the waters and you're telling your friends, man, I'm loving God. And maybe there's some mistakes here and there, but you're following Jesus to the best of your ability. You're reading the word or you're praying, you're finding community to get into a small group. You show up, you know, a couple of times a month and maybe you're serving. You're part of uh, We Love the Town and you're just engaged. And then I come up to you one Sunday morning. And I'm like, hey, man, it's so good to see you. How's your walk with Jesus been going? You're like, Pastor, this is going great. And I say, you know what? Hey, man, there's one thing that I don't know if you're aware of, but have you been circumcised? You're like, wait a minute, Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, you know what circumcision is, right? That would be an interesting conversation to have. <laughs> and not to be weird or funny. Well, to be funny, but not to be weird. But this is what was happening to the church. Because to them, circumcision meant that you were pure and dedicated to God. But when Jesus came, he didn't just you know, avoid that or throw that out the window. He fulfilled every requirement for us to be pleasing to God through his sacrifice. So because of that now, we have access to come into relationship and we have freedom in God because we are no longer indebted to God. Our sin and our shame and our failures and our past have all been absolved by the sacrifice that's in Jesus. And he says, and the battle rages on within you. But what are you going to do within that battle? Are you going to try to add to what you know as a pure faith? Are you going to try to do everything that you can in your mortal flesh, and your strength to please God? Are you going to follow this religious schedule? Are you going to add these additional ceremonies? Are you going to tell your boyfriend, hey, this is what you have to do and this and this and that? Are you going to do this? For, I mean, are you going to get into this paradigm where you live into this spirit of legalism and the only way to please God is based on what you do? But you have to realize is that as long as you live that way, you will live in failure because that's not the way that God created us to live. And many people have been broken and hurt and abused by church because they've taken on this re really weird understanding of church and relationship, and they've kind of superimposed their version of athleticism and how they used to play on their soccer team, and they tried to superimpose that onto Jesus, and it just doesn't fit. And Paul is saying, as long as you live this way of trying to please God in your flesh, it's actually null and void. You see, one of the things that I love about fighting, not that I'm a big fighter or anything, but I love watching those videos where you have this big old guy that gets into the ring and he's just like aggressive and, you know, pectorals would just look like ships and he just is like just abs on abs and this and that. I mean, the guy's just like in it and he gets in the ring and he's just staring, just, just looking beastly. And the camera pans to the opposite corner and there's a guy that looks like his name is Bob. And Bob's got a little bit of a belly, and he looks like he spent more time at KFC than in UFC. You know what I'm saying? And Bob's, like, waving at the crowd, smiling. And these guys, they say, you know, it's time to fight. They bring him into the center of the ring, and they pound, and the guy is looking all aggressive. And the guy goes, and he just starts, and he rushes at him. And Bob just kind of slowly backs up, sees his opening, dink, 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 dink. And Bob just literally wipes the floor with this guy. I love those type of little clips that show the underdog. But many times, that's how we live our life. We feel like we have to be and come in. And there are times where we have to have great animosity and we have to deal with sin and areas of our life that are dysfunction. But long term, God never intended for us to destroy the works of the flesh with the flesh, with just re religious strategy. What God wants to do is God wants to start something brand new inside of you. God wants to enable you that in those areas of compromise, maybe it is sexual sin that has constantly pulled you away. Maybe you constantly find yourself in that relationship that is pulling you away from Christ, pulling you away from God, and you've been able to fight that by just distancing yourself from relationships. But guess what? God wants to enable you to live a victorious life of freedom that when you do get into that relationship, it's not an issue of avoidance, it's an issue of vision. Are we going in the same direction? because I realize you may live according to your natural desires, but there are supernatural desires and goals in which God is leading me and I cannot afford to be distracted by that. 
And I know especially for a lot of our young men that that may be a struggle. Maybe you're dating someone and they're following Jesus and it is so hard for you to understand, like, how come we can't go there? Like, how come we can't just, you know, let, you know, how can we, how can we just can't lay hands on each other? And what you're realizing or what you're failing to realize is this, is the person that you may be in relationship with does not want to live according to the flesh because there are supernatural desires that are above and beyond what can just happen in that five minutes of intimacy. And what Paul is trying to address is that a life that is dedicated to this kind of mentality is actually not only going to hinder your earthly relationships, but it's going to hinder your relationship with Jesus. And if you want to live a victorious life, you have to realize you cannot just superimpose religion without regenerating the heart and allowing God to renew your mind to be able to walk out what he's called you to do. You see, some people have quit fighting. When it comes to temptation, because of trying to obtain some previous version of their relationship with Jesus that they had, they just give up. Because they failed too many times, they just stop fighting. Because they're tired, maybe they're even oblivious. People just quit fighting. But we, when we fight spiritual battles with fleshly tactics, there's a deeper battle that is at work. And whatever is being produced in your life, there is a root to it. You see, whenever sin becomes consistent in our life, we have to understand there's something deeper beneath the surface. You see, the second thing that I want to talk about is that the fruit of the flesh. These are areas and characteristics of our life that are contrary to God that begin to <laughs> ripen, sometimes at the worst situations. It says this in verse 19. It says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, and selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and even envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, the flesh is, is not the body. It's the broken areas of our soul, of our nature, that, that, that desire our own ambition. You see, the human nature is, is that is relenting and defying God and his laws in order to please ourselves. And what Paul is addressing is this, is that when we have all of these areas in our, in our life, they are indicators of what's really going on beneath the surface. For instance, if your life, you find yourself addicted to sexual morality and purity, maybe it's pornography that has rocked and ruled your life. Maybe you found this trend of consistent adultery. Maybe you found yourself in relationships that are consistently prom promiscuous and you find yourself giving up, giving too much of yourself too soon in a physical way. That is revealing, that is fruit of the flesh, that something is broken on the inside. And Jesus did not come just to bring shame and say, oh, wow, you will, you will run back, you will this. And what, what Jesus came is to redeem you so you would understand that something is at a deeper need. And whatever is ripening in your life, that's not the way that God created you for. Maybe there's anger and hostility and you find yourself in fits of rage and you just get tweaked by one thing. Your kids say something and somehow you blow up or you're in their relationship and something just tweaks you just a little bit and you begin to... This, this fit of rage and animosity and, and you begin to puff up and you literally begin to snap. No, 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 no. There, there's something broken in you. Because that's, that's the kind of evidence of something that is not being handled and nurtured and healed correctly. And I think most people live much of their life led by the flesh, even though they claim to follow Jesus. Much of their life is dedicated to pleasing themselves, even though it may have the veneer of godliness. You see, many times when God is addressing the fruit of your life, he will focus on the roots because the roots represent a system of our identity, a collection of our experiences and where we get our source of life and identity from. And that's why Jesus says, whoever wants to come and follow me must be born again, that we have to start afresh because of the fruits that are being produced in your life could be very toxic for you. He goes on and he says, idolatry and witchcraft 
and drunkenness and orgies. You see, some of the fruit, the things that are produced in our life, it's because sometimes we're just trying to numb the areas of our lives that are broken. So we find ourselves with indulgence to food and alcohol. We find that that three minutes or so of, of, of sexual you know, intimacy or whatever it may be, but it doesn't alleviate the pain in our souls. That area of unforgiveness, that hatred. And what Paul is saying is, is this, is that if your life is centered around these things, not only will that sever your relationship with God, it has very earthly uh, ramifications, but it's also eternal ramifications because those areas are revealing that sin is at the root of what you've allowed in your life. And it is robbing you. It is robbing you of the glory of God that is available to transform you. And so you have to understand that if you don't fight and fight correctly, and if you don't realize that there is a battle that is going on inside of you, instead of the superimposing religion and church and all of these things, but to ask God to lead you and to transform the way you perceive the world. You see, all of these are indicators of a deeper need of the soul. And those indicators are the aspects of the reality of Christ that has not infiltrated the root system of our lives. And it's creating toxicity, which the Bible is very clear. It is called sin. I'm not exempt from this. See, just the other day, I went to my friend's house and we were hanging out. And somehow someone said something. And it just triggered me. I mean, I either got angry and I got frustrated. And I remember walking out of that event and my wife, just like a good wife, she said, I don't know what's going on in you, but that didn't smell right. That, that fruit that just ripened at that one moment of your life, that wasn't good fruit. And through a little bit more investigation of analyzing that fit of rage, I was able to go and reverse engineer what was really going on. There are some areas of unforgiveness. There are some areas of brokenness in my life. And it started to produce something that was contrary to Jesus. Here's one of the things you have to understand. Following Christ is not easy. And what Paul is saying is this is a lifestyle of allowing our flesh, our carnal nature to rule and reign will lead us further away from God, further away from fulfillment, and further away from people. But what does a life look like when it's growing the right kind of fruit? It says in verse 22, it said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. You see, this is not a passive participation. That's why he says in verse 16, so I say, let us walk in the Spirit. And we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Jesus said it this way. He says, abide in me and I abide in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. And he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. What Paul is saying is this. A life that stays connected to Christ. It's not a passive, Jesus fix everything. But it is a holy partnership where you begin to ask God to enable you, not just to avoid sin, but to walk out and to resemble and model the life of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I don't want my past to hinder my future in walking in God. I've seen God do so many great things in my life, and I don't want areas that I've yet to yield to him, areas of compromise and brokenness and childhood confusion to be held from 
from him that God could not touch and deal with those areas in my life. But a life that is yielded to God begins to produce fruit, begins to produce peace, begins to produce joy, begins to produce patience. And he says this, Jesus said these words. He says, if you live connected to me, you will produce fruit. He says, if you live connected to religion, it produces death. If you live connected to legalism, it produces death. If you live connected to that anger, that wound, that pain, that brokenness, that perversion, it produces death. But if you allow God and his word and his love to enable you, Maybe we complicate it more than what it is. You see, what it means to walk in the spirit, it's this acknowledgement and understanding and the prayer that never stops to say, God, how can I be like you in this situation? You see, I was thinking about this, you know, many times when it comes to cell phones, we've had those moments where we've been out at a restaurant and we're like, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm out of juice. And every so minutes, we got to plug in that apple. dun 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 We have to plug in our phone. But Jesus says this. He says a life that is connected to him always has this limitless source of power and strength. Maybe we find ourselves being so connected with the pain of our past. Maybe we find ourselves being so connected with the shame. Maybe we find ourselves being so connected with a form of legalism or a way that we've created or interpreted the world to respond to our lives, a level of immaturity, and we wonder why we get so tired in the fight against temptation because temptation is destroying our lives because we don't just allow it to be temptation. Temptation is not the sin. When we see something and we want it, that's not sin. When we see something, we want it, we fantasize it, we dream about it, we begin to taste it, and then we go after it. That's when it becomes sin, and that's when it produces death in our life. But Jesus says if you want to produce life in your life, in your character, in your marriage, in your relationships, stay connected to me. He says if you stay connected, you'll never run out of juice. The question is, is this, what kind of fruit? Are you producing in your life? Are you able to stay connected with God? Are you able to stay connected with those that love God and create healthy community that's not just doing behavior modification, but they're encouraging you? Come on, let's grow some good fruit. You see, in this season, We have to rehabilitate our souls to live a life that's opposite of self-centeredness. And the only way that we can do that is with Jesus. Can I invite you, make this easier on yourself. Maybe every day when you get up, before you get out of the bed, ask God, God, help me bear good fruit. When you come to those moments of toxicity, when you realize this is something that is really problematic, rather than defending yourself, begin to pray this prayer, God, this is bad fruit in my life. Help me to see the roots. Maybe it's taking that next step of getting counseling. Maybe it's that taking that next step of reaching out to people in the body and in community. Because I believe that in this series, as we talk about fruit, the Lord is gonna challenge us. He's gonna inspire us. And he's going to create something very amazing in our lives. This morning, as you're watching this, I'm going to pray for you. And I always love praying for two groups of people. Number one, for those that are far away from Christ that are coming to faith for the first time. I'd say, Pastor Jules, I I don't have any fruit in my life. And if I do have fruit, it's the fruit that I, 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 it's some GMOs or something, man. I've modified it. I've, I've contaminated. I've done whatever I can do. And I realize It's not leading me to where I need to go. That's called sin. The Bible says when we confess with the mouth, believe in our hearts, God is so faithful to forgive us and wash us because Jesus ultimately paid the price for our sin. And we walk with Jesus. He enables us to be able to live this life of freedom. If you are far away from God, I just want you to pray this prayer. You say, Father, I need you. Help me to become like your son. Lord, I ask that you forgive me of my sin. 
Wash me, make me new, and help me to live this life you've created. If you prayed that prayer, I believe, man, that is an amazing, amazing moment. And I want to say thank you for having the boldness and the courage to step out and follow Christ. You don't have to do it alone. If you prayed that prayer, we would love to know about you making that decision to follow Christ. And if we're not connected to you, we would love to find, help you find a church where you can grow and produce the kind of fruit that God wants in your life. We would love to help you find community. If it's not with us, let us help you find somewhere that you can have community with so that you can grow in that relationship with God. But if this is your, the house that you wanna be a part of, let us know in the comments and just say, hey, I believe. Uh -uh. I decided to follow Jesus today. And we would love to walk with you and with those next steps. But many of you that are watching, maybe you're in the middle of a relationship. Maybe you're trying to figure out what this relationship is gonna look like. And you just know, man, this relationship has really been grounded in the flesh. We really have been doing things based on our own desires and how we feel we have not involved God in any of these matters. Man, I have not involved God in my life. The Bible is so gracious to us and it tells us to repent. A God does not want us to be excluded from eternity, but he gives us a free invitation to say, I want this kind of fruit. I want good fruit to be produced in your life. I wanna pray for you and pray that not only that God begins to work, not only through this series, but through this season of your life, begin to get down into the roots and expose those areas that are producing toxic areas of behavior, that God would begin to bring healing, God would begin to bring restoration to those areas of brokenness. Let's pray as we close. Father, we thank you so much for your word today, and we pray, God, teach us how to be people that fight and fight for the right kind of fruit. God, I pray, Lord, that areas of our life that have been damaged, broken, we've been church hurt, we've been hurt by relationships, Lord, and we find ourselves in this vicious cycle of producing things that get us further away from you. We pray, Lord, that you would break the cycle and you would start something new in our lives. We pray, Lord, that healing would take place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, we love you so much. Thank you for joining us. We can't wait to see you next week. Feel free to stay connected. Use our website or on any of the social media platforms or even the TFH Oakland app. We'd love to connect with you and we hope to see you in person. Many of our members are coming back. They're serving and they're getting involved and getting engaged and finding community. And so we would love to be able to have you at the Scottish Rite Center on Sunday mornings at 930. And we can't wait to see you and connect with you. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Thank you so much for joining us and spending uh, this time on us on Sunday morning or whenever you're watching this. You know, TFH Oakland is, we believe that family truly happens here and we want people to find community. We want you to experience the love of God and live fulfilled. We want you to do that. And I think one of the two greatest things about being a part of community is one, finding relationships and also serving. We know that God's put something very great and powerful for us and we want you to discover how you can live fulfilled. I wanna encourage you, if you've never taken our Discover class, feel free to sign up. Just go to the church website and say, join the, click join the team and sign up for our Discover. This is an opportunity for you to discover your gifts, find your purpose. We do personality and gift assessment tests, spiritual gift assessment tests, so you can find your place. And we've seen so many find themselves doing things that they never thought possible. We've seen outreaches start. We've seen people do, take on online uh, experiences and so much more. And we wanna partner with you in this season. Another part of finding life in TFH Oakland is community. And so with that, we would love for you to find a small group. A small groups, they happen throughout the week. We got yoga, Bible studies. So we got all kinds of groups and we want more. Maybe you're interested in starting a small group. Maybe you wanna be a part of, go to TFH Oakland, the website, and go click Get Connected. We can help you find a small group that best, best fits you and your time. We love you guys so much, and we are so excited that you decided to be a part of our community, and we hope to be a part of your family as well. Feel free to join us in person, and a shout out to all of our Dream Team. You guys have done an incredible job in just making the church run and function, and we're looking for so many more people that have that gift and that passion, and that God's designed them in a very special way to make an impact in our city and in our community. We love you guys so much, and we can't wait to see you next week. So stay connected, get involved, let's live a life engaged, and let's produce some of that fruit, that good fruit. Thank you.